welcome back to Murder Under the Midnight Sun. Thank you for joining me tonight. For today's episode, we're going to be hopping in the Wayback Machine, all the way back to the 19th century, long before Alaska was a state, in the heart of the Klondike Gold Rush. But before we get into it, let me just go ahead and mention my references for this episode. I read the book Soapy by Mike Miller, and the other book, Soapy Smith, The Life and Legacy of the Wild West's Most Notorious Con Man by Charles River Editors. They were both really short reads and pretty entertaining as well. As usual, this episode is brought to you by my kind and lovely Drop Dead Gorgeous patrons. If you'd like to become a patron, simply click the link in the show notes. I would greatly appreciate it. And of course, since Christmas is coming up, all of my patrons are going to be receiving some goodie boxes in the mail. So that's something to look forward to, I guess. This episode is also brought to you by my very own Etsy store. I know you're very excited to hear about it. I started making jewelry and like some hand sewn items and stuff. If you want to check it out, that would be awesome. I'll put the link in the show notes. Since I'm actually just about to move out of state permanently, every dollar helps, so thank you. That's right, this is gonna be my last episode actually recorded in Alaska, because I'm relocating to warmer climate down south. But have no fear, I will continue to do this podcast as long as there are interesting stories to tell or until I burn out, whatever comes first. So with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and hop into tonight's episode. Oh, and be sure to stick around at the end of the episode. I will be running a promo for another true crime podcast that you should check out. So stick around for that. Throughout the 19th century, many gold rushes occurred in various locations throughout North America, most notably in California at mid-century. The next huge one would occur nearly 50 years later in a much less hospitable climate. By the 1890s, there were already miners and prospectors scratching out a living in the Yukon Territory and Alaska. It was a very hard way of life though, and it would take a huge strike to pique massive interest in the area. This would happen in August of 1896, when a prospector in the Yukon Territory discovered gold at a place called Bonanza Creek located about 1,500 miles east of the boundary with Alaska. However, it would take nearly a year for news of the big strike to reach the west coast of the U.S. In July 1897, a steamship called the Excelsior docked in San Francisco and a bunch of miners fresh from the Yukon disembarked and their stories of streams and rivers full of gold began to spread like wildfire. Among the hundreds who had been mining in the Klondike region up to this point, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gold had already been found. With the commonly held notion being that there were still millions to be plundered from the icy waters. While in 1893, there had been around 300 miners in that region, by end of summer 1897, there were tens of thousands of miners heading north. The mostly male crowd came from all walks of life and many different countries. And while the location of the first big strike, the Klondike River region, would forever be linked to the massive gold exodus, miners would eventually find their ways to many other parts of the Yukon Territory and Alaska. To put the scale of the rush into context, in 1893, there were already a few miners up in Alaska. And in just the first year of the rush, 1897, The estimate of miners who headed north is between 20,000 and 30,000 people. And by the end of the century, estimates put the total number of gold diggers at around 100,000 people. Many towns that still exist today owe their genesis to the gold rush. It's hard to imagine, even now, that huge number of people making the long, grueling drive up here. But back then, of course, it was made much more difficult. Because of the long, harsh winters, Canada mandated that miners headed to the Klondike region had to have at least one year's supply of food, which worked out to roughly 1,000 pounds. This weight doesn't even include all of their other supplies. 
Miners would have to take a steamship up to the Alaskan towns of either Skagway or Daia, which no longer exists. Once there, they still had a 600-mile journey ahead of them, which would be accomplished via walking and boating. Some men were lucky enough to have pack animals, but most of them had the grueling task of hauling everything on their backs using a similar method of caching as described in the Wilcox Expedition episode. Despite the walking portion being less than 40 miles, it would take these men upwards of three months to cross that distance, and in the process, they would be truly covering hundreds of miles in their back and forth trips to move their gear along. It sounds like a nightmare to me. Once they reached the waters, they had a 560 mile float downriver to reach the gold fields. It was a very long and horrible journey, as well as being very expensive, and many men would end up leaving for home at the end of a year completely broke. Many of the best claims had already been staked by the time the bulk of the miners arrived, and it was a pretty small percentage of people that ended up getting truly rich from the rush. Another problem for a lot of the men that came up just with themselves was that a lot of the good gold veins could only be accessed using specialized and expensive equipment, a fact that hadn't really filtered out to many of the men heading north. They had images in their head of simply using a pan to find gold in the river silt, but this would not be the reality for the vast majority of them. Today's story involves an old-timey con man who decided to use the gold rush to pad his own pockets using the talents he had been honed to perfection over the years. One of the main populated gold rush towns was Skagway, Alaska, located near the top of the Alaskan Panhandle, right on the Canadian border. It would end up becoming a very important part of the gold rush. If you ever happen to read the Jack London book, The Call of the Wild, it actually takes place there. In the late 1880s, a steamship captain from BC named William Moore saw the potential in Skagway. He had been involved in gold mining and many other locations and he felt certain that sooner rather than later, there'd be large amounts of gold discovered in this region. He rightfully saw the place as being the perfect jumping off spot for miners heading to the interior gold rush. They built a massive homestead and a wharf, and William's son Ben married a local Klingit woman, which created a harmonious relationship with the local indigenous people. Moore's prediction came true. In the mid 1890s, he happened to meet the guy involved in the first huge strike at Bonanza Creek and passed along information about Skagway and the 35 mile trail leading from it to the river. And by 1897, the first steamship had docked at the new Skagway wharf and seemingly overnight, the population skyrocketed up to an estimated 10,000 people. It had quickly become the biggest city in Alaska by far. Oftentimes miners would disembark from steamships at Skagway and ended up, end up spending months there, gathering up the required amount of supplies to enter Canada. Others who came up to seek gold would end up living in Skagway long term. The town was bustling with new businesses and there was money to be made. Naturally, a town like this would attract those who wanted to make a quick and easy buck without the legal aspect. Criminals and con men made their way north as well. Beautiful women also came north to make big bucks working in the saloons and dance halls that were always packed with deep-pocketed men. One of my all-time favorite movies actually takes place in this environment. The Gold Rush is a 1925 Charlie Chaplin movie, where Charlie is a prospector who has come north to get rich and falls in love with a dance hall girl that he meets. It's still hilarious even 95 years later, and I highly recommend it. Our story takes place here at the height of Gold Rush fever. In 1897, when an out-of-state gangster and grifter headed north with the plan of scamming the huge population of miners out of as much money as possible. Jefferson Randolph Smith II was born in 1860 in Georgia. He spent the first few years of his life on a prosperous plantation. However, his family headed west to Texas after the Civil War. 
At a young age, he had actually considered going into the ministry, but his father was a raging alcoholic and he ended up dropping out of school to work and support the family. Eventually, he too began to gravitate to the bottle, and as he got a little bit older, he moved into the world of grifting. As the story goes, he started learning several different short cons after himself losing a month's wages to a con that he came across at one of P.T. Barnum's circuses in Texas. One scam that he came across would come to define him. This involved him selling bars of soap in front of a crowd. As the crowd watched, he would wrap up some of the bars with big bills, sometimes up to $100. He would then wrap the bars back up in their regular packaging and offer to sell a bar for $5. The audience members that were in on the scheme would step forward and buy a bar, which they'd unwrap to reveal the money that they'd won. After a few of these fake winners, or shills, Jefferson would be swarmed by the audience offering to buy up all of his soap. A few others might win one or two dollars, but of course no one would actually really win the big bucks. It was from the scheme that Jefferson got the nickname that would stick with him for the rest of his life, Soapy. And it was by that name that he would become known as one of the most infamous con artists of the Wild West. While living in Fort Worth, he amassed a loyal group of men that would participate in the scams with him, and they quickly became a gang. Eventually, they migrated to Denver, Colorado, where gambling was legal at the time. They quickly ingratiated themselves to locals, including law enforcement and politicians, many of whom would end up on Soapy's payroll. Soapy's gang operated almost like Robin Hood's merry band of thieves. They would scam tourists with shell games, then donate some of their ill-gotten gains to local churches. The difference, of course, being that they weren't really robbing the rich, they were simply scamming anyone unlucky enough to fall for one of their confidence tricks. And while they often used their takings to feed the poor, build churches, and otherwise help local residents, they were also filling their own pockets. By his early 20s, Soapy's gang reigned supreme over the criminal underworld of Denver, and they held on to this power for many years. Despite his reputation as being a charitable gangster, Smith and his gang were definitely not criminals of the nonviolent variety, and most of them were armed at all times. In his young adulthood, he had married a young woman named Addie and had a couple of children. But eventually, after years of marriage, she couldn't tolerate being the wife of a con artist and criminal, and she would end up leaving Denver and moving off to St. Louis, but the couple remained married. By the mid-1890s, their position in Denver was jeopardized when a new governor took office on an anti-corruption platform. His attempt to force out corrupt local politicians actually led to an armed standoff between the state militia and a ragtag group of men recruited by members of the Denver underworld, and which included Soapy, of course. They were guarding City Hall, and the politicians had refused to be forced out. Luckily, even though the militia brought in Gatling guns and a couple of cannons, the situation didn't turn into an all-out war. Eventually, the Colorado Supreme Court decided the issue and sided with the governor. The corrupt politicians were forced out, and the governor's appointees took their new positions. Gambling and other vices were soon made illegal, and Soapy's gang knew it was time to move on. Like everyone else on the West Coast, Soapy's gang began to hear about all sorts of stories of people striking it rich up north. Knowing just how many possible marks would be regularly coming through Skagway, Soapy settled on the idea of heading up there, taking over the town, and making as much money on his cons as possible. So in 1897, he and some of his loyal gang members took the long trip up north. They were excited upon arrival to learn that there were only a couple of lawmen in town and they certainly had never experienced the type of crimes caused by a large population. The town was growing daily, and with new men swarming into town all the time, there seemed to be endless possibilities of people to rip off. The new men arriving in town really just must have looked like lambs to the slaughter to the Skagway gang. They would come off the boat fresh-faced, eyes wide with excitement over the prospect of finding gold, and loaded down with all of their excess money, just waiting to be scammed out of their pockets. 
Their youthful naivete would be short-lived, as many would fall prey to the cons of the gang, and most would end up with nothing to show for the time up north. One of Soapy's accomplices that came north with him was Charles Bowers, aka Reverend Bowers. He disguised himself as a reverend and was described as having, quote, the voice of a saint and the soul of Satan. Other gang members that made the trip were Slim Jim Foster, Red Gibbs, Sid Dixon, George Wilder, Van Triplett, and a bunch of others with equally silly names. Soapy and the Reverend went way back, and they would form the backbone of the Skagway gang. Both men were quick-witted and very charming, and they easily ingratiated themselves to the waves of newcomers arriving in town. They would throw money around buying drinks for all the men before setting up a scam, which would often be a shell game. This type of game is still played today, whether the player uses shells or cups or whatever. Essentially, they would put a small item, like a pea, under one shell or cup, among three, then they would shuffle them around, and the player would have to bet that he knew which shell was covering the item. It's a simple game, one that can easily get a crowd excited if multiple players start to win. Several gang members would be planted in the audience as though they were just another newcomer in Skagway, and these shells would then win large amounts of money at the shell game, which would encourage the actual targets to bet big. Of course, most con men, this gang included, don't play the game fairly and use sleight of hand to ensure the outcome they want. With quick talking and even faster hands, anyone could do this game and scam people out of their money. But it also takes keen perception of potential targets to keep the game going and to know when to let someone win. After all, this would often be a huge source of entertainment in the crowded bars of Skagway, and the con man wants not only to allow targets to have the illusion that they could possibly win, they also want to keep the crowd interested. There was a certain amount of human psychology involved in determining how to handle each target. It could be a delicate thing. But however many times Soapy let someone win, the gang would always walk away with the big score. The house always wins. Soapy was a smart guy and he was really good at reading people. And he was also charming enough that even if he had just taken a man's entire life savings, he was still likable. And even if he had not been likable, the population was so transient that there were always new targets to be had. Smith spent most of his days in one of the Skagway bars doing either the soap game or the shell game, generally ending up with hundreds of dollars by the end of that day's work. And that was just him. On any one day, several gang members would have different games going on in multiple locations throughout town. Of course, they weren't the only swindlers in town. Many other con men with their own scams had made their way to Skagway as well. The explosion and growth of the town had not been matched with adequate law enforcement, so it was a lot easier to get away with nonviolent crimes. Soapy's goal of running Skagway, just as he had done with Denver, came closer to reality because of a murder. A local saloon owner named John Fay had refused to give change to a customer named Andy McGrath. McGrath had complained to the local deputy named Rowan, and the two came back to Faye's bar to confront him. Upon seeing the two men enter his saloon, Faye had shot both and Deputy Rowan had died. That exact day, Rowan's wife was in the midst of giving birth. Several local men, upon hearing what had happened, accosted Faye and decided to lynch him in the street. When Soapy heard about this barbarism, he stepped in. He told the townspeople that he and his men were going to protect Faye and that whatever he had done, he deserved a fair trial. He then played upon the local sympathies by taking up a collection for the new mother who was now widowed. In making this gesture, he was able to present himself as being on the side of law and order and was able to gain the respect of the locals who began to see him as a leader. He soon started a saloon named after himself and it became a very popular Skagway hangout. While a large number of residents and those passing through were quick to respect the leadership role that Smith had assumed, not everyone was so easily fooled. A local group took on the name the Committee of the 101 
and dispersed a message saying that all criminals must leave town. In retaliation, Soapy started a committee called the Committee of the 303, and insisted they were actually the group that called for law and order against criminal acts. He already had some local businessmen on his payroll and was able to get their backing in presenting himself as the leader of the ruling committee. Next, Smith was able to get in the good graces of Christian residents by taking up an offering to help a new preacher in town to start a church. Soapy then formed a group of men known as the Skagway Guards, which was a militia with the intent to go off to the Spanish-American War. But the War Department wasn't interested in having this random group of men join in. But he maintained the guards as just another show of his power. He continued to have bizarre delusions that the Spanish would make their way to Skagway and be held off by this small group of men. On July 4th of that year, Soapy was the Grand Marshal of the first ever 4th of July Parade in Skagway. The parade was populated by the Skagway Guards putting on a patriotic show for the crowd, and Soapy was given many accolades by everyone. However, he would not manage to keep his stronghold on the town for much longer. His day of reckoning was coming quickly. Just four days later, in fact, on July 8th, which is my birthday, one prospector returned from the gold fields having been one of the few to really strike it rich. His name was John Douglas Stewart, and he'd prospected the equivalent of $80,000 in 2019 money. Having returned to Skagway with his newfound wealth, Stewart was staying in town until the next boat was departing south. He was quickly targeted by the Smith gang after having heard of his windfall. They urged him to join them in a game of cards, and he quickly lost the meager amount of cash that he had on hand. Knowing he had gold stored away somewhere, they urged him to show them the gold he had found to use as collateral for more betting. He showed them a small amount, and they held him up while one ran off with the gold. Stewart refused to kowtow to demands to keep the incident quiet, and word spread quickly throughout the town of the robbery. Smith had not been involved in the robbery, but when he caught wind of Stewart running his mouth off, he tried to debunk the rumor by saying that Stewart had lost the gold fair and square. But he, he said he would do what he could to get it returned to him, so long as Stewart kept his mouth shut and stopped trying to get the authorities involved. But that wasn't going to happen. Many local residents, having heard about what happened, confronted Soapy and told him he must admit there was a robbery and reveal who had done it. Many of these locals were miners and prospectors themselves, and they didn't take kindly to the thought of sanctioned thievery from those returning from the gold fields. Law enforcement got involved. The new deputy insisted that Smith return the gold and give up the thieves' names but Soapy refused to back down from his cover story, and he left the conversation angrily. Soon thereafter, the deputy decided it was time to arrest Soapy and all of the gang members. He got the backing of dozens of men who would help him with the arrest and attempt to take the men alive. But first, there was a community meeting that evening to try to figure out how to solve the crime problem in Skagway, and Soapy's gang were prohibited from attending. Four men stood guard outside the meeting at the wharf to keep Smith from entering. One of them, Frank Reed, was armed with a revolver while the others were unarmed. One local reporter sought out Soapy and warned him that something bad was brewing and that he better do something about it before something was done for him. Soapy grabbed a rifle and several of his gang and they headed towards the wharf where the community meeting was being held. As Soapy strode angrily up to the wharf, most of the men standing guard moved aside so that he could pass through, but not Frank Reed. Details of what happened next are hazy, as no one was close enough to really see. But the two men scuffled and drew their weapons, attempting to fire at each other. The crowd heard several shots go off, and Reed fell down with multiple bullet wounds. <laughs> 
Smith was still standing, though. He, too, had been shot. And his gang rushed to join in the fray. But before they could get there, one of the other guards who was on wharf duty, Jesse Murphy, managed to run up to Smith, take his rifle, and shoot Smith in the heart with his own gun. The mighty con man fell to the ground, stone dead. Smith's gang initially tried to keep the fight going and avenge his death, but at about the same time, the meeting at the wharf was breaking up and dozens of men were coming to see what the hell was going on. Someone yelled that someone yelled to Smith's gang that they better get the hell out of there. They took that advice and fled the area. Soapy's body would lay for several hours on the ground before someone finally decided to do something with it. He would later be buried outside the city, and not long after he died, he started to become one of the many Wild West outlaws that was romanticized by people who didn't know him personally. In the last 120 years, he has been memorialized and mythologized in poetry, plays, and many, many books, many of which paint him out to be some sort of folk hero. Reed was still alive after the gunfight, despite having been shot multiple times. A large group of men hoisted him up and carried him off to get medical care. He languished for another two weeks before perishing from his wounds. He was given a hero's burial with nearly every Skagway resident in attendance. At his gravesite on a large stone monument, it reads, he gave his life for Skagway. Ironically, Reed had been the main leader of the committee of 101 that so greatly opposed the Smith gang. Within the few days after the gunfight, Smith gang members were rounded up and either sent out of Skagway or arrested. The missing gold from John Stewart was also found and returned to him. In December of 1898, three of Soapy's comrades went on trial. Van Triplett, Doc Powers, and Slim Jim Foster were all convicted for a myriad of crimes and sent off to serve their time at San Quentin Prison. The story goes that the jury took less than 10 minutes to vote for conviction for all three. Slim Jim had actually been the main aggressor in robbing Stewart of his gold. I tried but couldn't find information on why these three men were arrested while others, such as Reverend Bowers, were let go, and I also couldn't find out what happened to them after they left Skagway. Well, that wraps up this short episode for you guys. Thank you for listening. I just wanted to get something out to you. And I'm going to play you a promo for another true crime podcast you should check out. Until next time, good night. I am your host, JD Horror, and this is True Crime Horror Story, a true crime podcast designed like an anthology horror movie. It is definitely not for the faint of heart and won't be played for laughs. Join us on July 11th, 2019 for the debut episode. In season one, we will highlight both notorious and obscure incidents of real life murder. From world famous psychopaths like the Night Stalker Richard Ramirez, to lesser known evils that you may not have heard of, but have effects just as catastrophic for the victims and their families. Subscribe now wherever podcasts can be consumed, and check out our website at www.truecrimehorrorstory.com and Instagram at True Crime Horror Story. True Crime Horror Story. Sometimes truth is more brutal than fiction.